Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson on differential geometry. In this video we're going to discuss the normal plane and the principal normal vector of a curve and then go over the idea of torsion. Suppose that gamma of s is a unit speed curve in three-dimensional real space and the parameter s represents the arc length so gamma of s is reparameterized with respect to arc length. Suppose also that t or d gamma by ds represents the unit tangent vector. Of course, since gamma is a unit speed curve, its derivative is guaranteed to have a magnitude of 1, which is why gamma dot is straight up just the unit tangent vector. Let's draw an example gamma of s to illustrate this tangent vector. Recall from my curvature video that the curvature of gamma is a measure of how much gamma deviates from a straight line. It's a measure of how much it deviates from the tangent vector, which I'm going to draw right here. In that curvature video, I used this normal vector n hat to describe the direction in which gamma was curving away from the straight line. Another way to describe curvature is to measure how quickly the unit tangent vector to the curve changes. If I had a straight line, for instance, then the unit tangent vector, which is in the exact same direction as the straight line, the unit tangent vector would not change as I go down the line. Because it's not changing, I can say that the curvature of the straight line is zero, which makes sense. A straight line does not curve. However, for an arbitrary curve like gamma of s, the changing nature of the unit tangent vector can be used to describe the curvature. If I had a curve where the unit tangent vector changed very quickly in direction, that curve would have a larger curvature. On the other hand, if I had a curve like this, where the unit tangent vector changes very gradually, that curve would have a smaller curvature. Therefore, another way to describe the intuition behind curvature is to frame curvature as the quickness at which the unit tangent vector changes direction. Now, how do you measure the quickness at which t changes? You could take the derivative, of course. The derivative of t with respect to the parameter s can be said to be directly proportional to the curvature kappa, which is generally a function of the position along the curve s. The problem with this expression, though, is that kappa is a scalar, while dt by ds is a vector. So we need to multiply the curvature by the vector which points in the direction that the curve curves to complete this equation. And what's the best vector to use that points in the direction of curvature? The normal vector, of course. So as a result, we can say that dt by ds is kappa of s times n hat of s. And I'll call this equation 1, where n hat is our unit normal vector. This leads us to the definition of the principal normal vector. The principal normal vector of a curve gamma at a point gamma of s is given by the vector n of s, which is equal to dt by ds divided by the curvature kappa. It's just the previous equation rearranged to isolate the n. So if I draw my curve again, I have this unit tangent vector t and this unit normal vector that's perpendicular to the tangent vector. Now these two vectors n and t together make something quite special. Recall from basic geometry slash linear algebra that a plane can be uniquely determined using two vectors that don't fall on the same line or two non-collinear lines. Since the unit tangent vector and unit normal vector are perpendicular, they together determine a unique plane which passes through the normal and the tangent at the point of tangency on gamma of s. This plane is called the oscillating plane. The oscillating plane is only there if the curvature is non-zero. If the curvature is zero, we cannot have a unit normal vector since this equation for n would just be undefined. Theoretically, if we had a straight line with zero curvature, we could make a vector perpendicular to the tangent vector and call that the normal, but we wouldn't know where the normal is pointing since we wouldn't know where the curve is curving. So that's why the normal vector is undefined for a straight line. Now, in addition, since n and t are perpendicular or orthogonal unit vectors, we can define another unit vector which is perpendicular to both n and t called the binormal vector b. The binormal vector is defined as the cross product of t with n. In this particular case, since the tangent vector points this way and the normal vector points this way, the binormal vector by the right-hand rule points outside the blackboard. It literally breaks the fourth wall and points towards you, the viewer. Now, how did I determine that? Well, I used the right-hand rule, curl the fingers in your right hand in the shortest direction going from t to n, and since your fingers will curl in the counterclockwise direction, your thumb will point up, and the direction your thumb points is the direction of the binormal or cross-product vector, which is why the direction of the binormal vector is outside the blackboard. Let's now talk about torsion by first describing the intuition behind torsion. So we'll start again with a typical unit speed curve gamma of s on a plane, a curve that just initially looks like a circle. 
If I look at this point on the curve right here, its unit tangent vector looks like this, and its unit normal vector looks like this. The binormal vector points up outside the blackboard. If I go along this curve on the plane, then the tangent vector is going to change. So for instance, it goes from this to this as we move to this next point. And because the tangent vector changes, the normal vector changes. It goes from this to this. However, because we're remaining on the same plane, the binormal vector doesn't change. It still points in the same direction outside the blackboard. So if a curve remains in a single plane, its binormal vector will not change. But what if I draw a helix in three dimensions? So if I got my x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, and I draw this helix over here. For a three-dimensional curve like a helix, the binormal vector does change. So it might start out pointing straight up in the direction of the z-axis, but then over here it points diagonally up like this. So as we've gone from here on the curve to here on the curve, our binormal vector has changed. And this change in the binormal vector represents how much our curve has curled out of the plane it was originally in. It's not like the regular curvature that we have before, the change in the tangent vector. This change in the binormal vector represents the degree to which the curve curls outside the oscillating plane we talked about earlier. And this is where torsion comes in. Just like how curvature represented the quickness with which the unit tangent vector of a curve changes as we go along the curve, the torsion or tau represents the quickness with which the unit binormal vector changes as we go along the curve, or how quickly and strongly the curve curls outside its immediate two-dimensional plane, its oscillating plane. Now how do we measure the quickness at which the binormal vector changes? Well, we take the derivative. So the torsion, which is generally a function of the position along the curve, is directly related to the derivative of the binormal vector. It's directly proportional. The problem with this expression, again, just like the curvature expression from before, is that tau is a scalar, while dv by ds is a vector. So we need to multiply the torsion by the vector, which points in the direction that the curve contorts or curls out of its plane to complete this equation. To do that, let's revisit the expression for the binormal vector, the cross product of the tangent vector t and the normal vector n. If we take the derivative of this expression with respect to s, then we can use the product rule, which also applies to the cross product, to get the following. We know that the derivative of the tangent vector is actually just the curvature times the normal vector from equation 1, so we can plug that in to get this expression. But we also know that the cross product of a vector with itself is just 0, so this first term entirely cancels out. And this cancellation leaves us with the following expression. Now, because dv by ds is the cross product of both the tangent vector and bn by ds, where n is the normal vector, dv by ds is orthogonal to both the tangent vector and dn by ds. Now, dn by ds itself must be orthogonal to the normal vector, because the derivative of a vector of constant magnitude is always orthogonal to the original vector being differentiated. Let me go on the side and show why that's the case. Suppose I have a vector r that depends on a parameter t. If the magnitude of this vector, so the dot product of r with itself, is a constant c, then we can differentiate both sides with respect to t to get the following, where we have the dot product of r and its derivative in t equal to zero. What does this mean? Well, because the dot product of these two vectors is zero, the vectors are orthogonal. As a result, we can conclude that if we have a vector-valued function of constant magnitude, this function will always be orthogonal to its derivative. So if we go back, we can see why the derivative of the unit normal must be orthogonal to that unit normal, because the unit normal has a constant magnitude of 1, and therefore, as we just showed, its derivative is going to be orthogonal to it. Now with this, we have a situation where the derivative of our binormal vector is orthogonal to the tangent vector and is orthogonal to the vector that's orthogonal to the normal vector. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in only one possible situation, which is that dv by ds is parallel to the unit normal vector. We know that the unit normal vector is orthogonal to the tangent vector and that the unit normal vector is orthogonal to dn by ds, as we just showed. So it would then make sense that db by ds is parallel to the normal vector. And this fact allows us to write an equation for the torsion, that the torsion multiplied by the unit normal vector gives us the quickness at which the binormal vector changes, or db by ds. We've defined torsion with a negative sign out front like this because that's the typical convention, mainly because it makes algebra simpler down the line with fewer negative signs later on. 
Anyway, hopefully that should give you some intuition and a good mathematical sense of torsion. The last few moments of this video are going to define two other planes we haven't mentioned yet. The first is the normal plane. Now remember how the oscillating plane was formed by the unit tangent vector and the unit normal vector? Well, the normal plane is a unique plane formed by the unit normal vector and the unit binormal vector. And the other plane that I'm going to talk about, the rectifying plane, is a unique plane formed by the tangent vector and the binormal vector. Anyway, that should do it for this video. Hopefully you now understand the intuition behind torsion and some other concepts that we defined here. In the next lesson, I'm going to talk about the frenet serre equations, which are pretty important in differential geometry. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.